you wrote it about, you mentioned someone named Georgia. Yeah. So you wrote the song about how much you, you loved her, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there was an... Uh, Do you want to talk about this? Sure, of course. Okay, sure. sure. Okay, I mean, it's, it's all right. Like, I, I wish her only the very best always. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you want to wish anybody the very best, mm -hmm. you know? I got a few people I wouldn't want to wish the very best to. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, uh, genuinely. Uh, it's It's been a... Tremendous tour that's been exciting, and um, I, I feel good personally, which is nice. Uh, the boys feel good. It's just been great. Things have been going great. So uh, let, let's let's talk about the whole thing. Yeah. Unlikely for someone of your age um, to be into this sort of older music, and I say this as someone who, like you, uh, at your age, was really really into older music, and yeah. I, fe I felt like a bit of an aberration. So I'm always really. In my, a lot of my friends are really into older music, sure. and I'm always really curious about what gets them into that thing. But I think mm. for you, it was, it was your some a record collection in your family. Yeah. So so my grandfather, he's got property on, with my grandma in San Jose, California, yeah. and way up in the you know mountains and all that, uh, with like <laughs> two neighbors on either side. Like it's very very isolated. And you know, I was growing up there. You know, my whole life going up there, obviously visiting family, and you know spending time and natural curiosity just being in a place where there wasn't really anything to do but explore. Um, I found myself ripping through boxes that were in the garage because there's so many things to look at and, and see. And so I ended up finding records and, you know, the sleeves were just beautiful. Like, I mean, it was just these painted covers of these old crooners and these really nice bespoke suits and, you know... They're like, the picture has them sat under like starlight that's like very exaggerated and beautifully painted and like a couple of dancing in the sky and stuff like that. And it was, it was attractive to me just right out of the gate just because of that, like the, the art of it was so beautiful. And then having discovered it, you know, as like a 10 year old, I'd like pull out records and then show my grandpa what I'd found and he'd pull me upstairs and we'd sit upstairs and listen through these old speakers that he collected from 40 years ago and uh, he fixed up and uh, when it came to actually making this this album it was exciting for me because it felt like something that just felt so intrinsic just out of the gate because it was just like oh like I've been listening to these artists like Roy Orbison yeah like for 12 years were, were you, you know? when you started writing songs did they sound like like w w was it very natural for you to go to those shapes to those chord progressions to those melodies of of those older recordings? Not initially. It's really funny. Like you know, uh, I grew up listening to that music, but it was purely out of just enjoyment. I really got into, you know, the singer songwriter. Like you know, it was the time when like the folk indie thing was happening. Like Van Fance Joy, Fleet Foxes. Fleet Foxes, like Lord Huron. Yeah. You know, we, we you know, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, bon Iver was like just releasing like just the singer songwriter stuff. These were artists that I really wanted to make music that sounded like, I wanted to make music that sounded like them. Right. Because I, I respected and loved the music and how it made me feel. But it wasn't something that I was making, you know, that felt like me all the way. Yeah. And then, you know, with Until I Found You, like mm -hmm. I was I was dating a girl, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that song was like purely just experimental. Like, I love that music. Like, I just bought this guitar, bought this amp that's like very 50s and 60s sounding. You know, the tremolo and the reverb and all that. I just started playing around and then boom, that song just existed just purely out of the idea of like, I love that music so much. Like, what if I wrote a song like that that sounded like that. Pull those headphones up on your ears there. Let's, let's, yeah. just, let's just listen to a little bit of it. Never let you go again like I did or used to say I would never fall in love again until I found her I said I would never fall in there since you I fall into Beautiful. Steven Sanchez in a song called Until I, I Found You. Um, a little Buddy Holly there, too. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of Buddy Holly there yeah, as well. Not? You know, for sure, you know. Um, and I, 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 I hesitate to mention too much of these artists because I, 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 my guess would be that you don't want to seem like a nostalgia act or you don't want to seem like a retro act or anything like that. Like it's a, I mean, I think it's a cool honor in a way, I think. I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, those guys did it, you know. Like they, they really just shaped 
like what music was going to turn into yeah. before like we got there, yeah. you know, which is great. I mean, I have such respect for them, the songwriting, the like the innocence of it. I, yeah. I, I think if I end up, you know, associating in any way with them, I think that's cool. <laughs> the, that. the, the innocence of it. Yeah. I don't know. Like if we look at, you know, TikTok songwriters, like there's definitely a a level of artistry that songwriters have on that platform. They're utilizing it because they really are talented and they really have something to say. But then there's also the very, you know, almost feels like the majority uh, that writes songs, you know, to go viral because there's like this desire to be important and recognized in the world. And like, they will do that at any cost, even at the expense of actually writing something that means something and is an additive to the world. And I feel like songwriters back then, they were writing because it was like a means of, of, of survival of like keeping this love together, you know, back then and, and keeping this innocence uh, you know, somewhere in the world. Artists like Sam Cooke, right? Mm -hmm. And and the Platters. Mm -hmm. And I just have so much respect for that. And it's such a difference in music now where it's like, it, it feels like there's not a a means of survival sort of mentality in songwriting. Like that it's not this like, if I don't say this in this way, if I don't confess like my soul in this way, then like it's not good enough to be put out into the world. Yeah, It feels like now it's like, I want to go viral because yeah. I want to feel important mm -hmm. and I want it to be about me mm -hmm. when actually in reality, music's about people and, and the experience and, and soundtrack and what's happening with them, not what's happening with just you. You know, I, I hear what you're saying. There's, there's, yeah. it, it, it's a very uncynical way of making music. It's a very uncynical yeah. way is to, to, to look at your own expression and the things I need to say out here and sure. the things that I need to put out there into the world, whether to try to change the world or try to express some sort of like, um, you know, it, 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 individual heartbreak or something like that. It's a very uncynical way to do it as opposed to like, hey, I want to put this thing out. And it's going to be 15 seconds because it's, it's going to be looped. Exactly. But yeah. I should say sure. it, it did work out in that way for you, which is very interesting. I mean, <laughs> uh, until I found you, for people who aren't familiar with it, um, five times plus platinum 1.7 billion streams number one on the billboard alternative chart and and Holy perhaps crap. most interestingly millions and millions of views on tiktok mm -hmm. so there there you see i think that the the in that there there could be um interpreted as proof that uh, younger uh, music listeners in their early 20s or whatever, you know, the mm -hmm. ones that, that are being quote-unquote marketed to you, as you mentioned. Absolutely. They have an appetite towards more uncynical music. Yeah, exactly. Which I think it's great for that as well. Like, the platform is so great for that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that... You just got to give it to them. You, you just got to give it to them. You yeah. got to give them the thing that's like, that feels like it's got some meat to it. You wrote it about, you mentioned someone named Georgia. Yeah. So you, you wrote the song about how much you, you loved her, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there was an... Uh, Do you want to talk about this? Sure, of course. Okay, sure. sure. Okay, I mean, well, it's yeah. it's all right. Like, I, I wish her only the very best always. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you want to wish anybody the very best, mm -hmm. you know? I got a few people I wouldn't want to wish the very best to. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, it, but it feels it feels like a weight off your own shoulders to just be like, you know what? I, I hope things will turn out sure, all right for sure, them. Sure, sure, sure. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, we we had tried to date and some things happened in my life that kind of moved me to not pursue things and kind of push her away and I and I did. And uh and that song is just kind of about that time where I had pushed her away and there was this realization over those months where I'd been away from her that oh, like I'm I'm at the time like I'm I am devastated without this person in my life. And I think that's a universal feeling of just like the absence of a person that you get to know, like, can really just flip your world upside down in a lot of ways. And uh, for me, this song, like, when it when it actually was written, like, we had dated, you know, we were dating, and mm. it, was, it was great. I was like, I'm so in love. This mm -hmm. is wonderful. And uh, then it was like this reflection of, oh, man, I can't imagine being back in that spot where I, I lost her. I have I have uh, I've had the luxury of having friends who I've had the luxury of having friends. Yeah. I've had the luxury of having <laughs> you know, look at me. I mean it's, it's unlikely. Yes. I, I've had the luxury of having friends yeah. who uh, have written songs about how much they're in love with their uh, girlfriend or boyfriend mm. or, or or whatever. Uh, that song uh, this has happened to uh, two of my friends actually, and the the songs have done very well, and they've mm -hmm. they've made a couple of bucks off of them, mm -hmm. and 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 therefore they have to sing them every night at the show, and mm -hmm. if they don't sing it, everyone boos and goes home <laughs> unsatisfied. Well, you know what I mean, right? Totally. And, sure. and in each of those cases, um, 
they're they they're not together with the mm-hmm. person anymore. Yeah. And I'm always very curious about like, well, what's it like to get on stage and sing that song then every single night? It feels like the song doesn't really belong to me at this point anymore. Like it, it's it's one of those things where it's like people are creating memories beyond the memories I had with the person that I was dating and wrote the song about. And so it feels like because there's more than just my memories attached to it, it feels like it belongs to something more than just myself. When I see a couple dancing in the crowd, connecting to a uh-huh. song that, you know, I wrote for somebody that I once danced with, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's really special. It's a really special thing, uh, especially when I, I look at it from the perspective of these people have no idea, like, what that relationship was like for me. All they know is how that song makes them feel when they're with that person. Oh, and yeah. they're able to, like, be all in on each other while listening to this song. And that is that is the coolest thing to watch. And it, it's so special for me. So I've got no qualms with it. And I, I love the song still. It's still... It's still great. It is. It's, it's it's a beautiful yeah. song, and it, and, yeah. and once again, it did very well for you. I mentioned I mentioned all the streams and the and the charts and the TikTok. I have to imagine it's a life changing song. Totally. I'm still like even the stats you just told me. I, I didn't even know some of those. So thank you. I made <laughs> I mean cool. I made I made some of them up. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's got 30,000. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's more of a two truths and a lie situation. Yeah, you sure. You figure it out. No, no, it's, I mean, it's doing incredibly well. Yeah. And my, my understanding is that uh, El- Elton John reaches out. He does. What does a phone call from Elton John sound like, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> it's always him letting you know that it's him. It's always like a, it's, it's actually- Elton. I'm like... I know. Hey, hi. How are you? You know, it's always a, uh, a me saying hello, and he goes, "It's Elton." And I'm like, "Yes, I, I, I know." How are you? But, but he, he, <laughs> he. By the way, uh, a, a great admirer in the early late 1960s and early oh, 1970s yeah. of a lot of those old recordings as well. Oh yeah. You know, um, he, he reaches out to tell you that he's a, he's a fan. That must be meaningful to you. Incredibly. I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, his records were some that I pulled out of the box in my oh, grandpa's house. Oh, really? So it's, it's very, very cool. The first time I ever listened to Elton John was that way, which is cool. And it was like, you know, listening to, you know, The Bitch is Back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, oh, God, it's just so cool to think back on that time because you, know, you spend so much time watching something and, and admiring something and listening to something and then to be face first with it. It's like, it's very... Uh, intimidating in like a beautiful way as well. It's like, wow, this is very, very full circle. Um, and you did Glastonbury with him, right? We did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still insane to like be able to say that truthfully. Yeah. You know, it feels like a lie every time I mention it. <laughs> and I don't really, I don't like bring it up and talk about it a lot. I also, like, I don't know any artists, like when they do something very significant like that, that like brings it up all the time. Like it very much sits in the pocket of your mind a little mm-hmm. bit and you just kind of reflect on it. Yeah. How does it feel on, on, on stage? Um, when you, in that, in that moment, what's that feeling like? I mean, that's like a lot of people out there. Honestly, I just, I remember just hearing it. I remember him setting off the show, Pinball Wizard, fireworks going off and the crowd. And it was, it was so loud that it was like quiet. Like it was so loud that it was just, it didn't seem like there were that many people there. If that makes any sense, like it was so, like the space was so big. We were outside that all the cheers just kind of flew to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it didn't feel like it could come back and hit you. Like it just felt like it was just going into heaven. I remember getting ready, you know, I, I used the bathroom and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Brandon Flowers is, is his green room is next to the bathroom. From, from the killers. From the killers. And, uh, he's, <laughs> I remember just <laughs> walking into the bathroom and I was peeing <laughs> <laughs> and he's singing Tiny Dancer. No, Brandon Flowers <laughs> from the killers? Cause he was singing it with Elton John at Glastonbury. Like he was the guest. Yeah. At, I just remember going, I'll make close a oh. tiny dance. And I'm just like, I remember laughing to myself and like saying it out loud. I'm like, Stephen, like, please don't forget the fact that Brandon Flowers is singing Tiny Dancer While You Peed. And that's the weirdest, <laughs> that's the weirdest thing that's happened. And so there are all these weird, strange moments before actually getting to the stage. And I, I remember finally it was like, okay, now it's my time to go up. And I remember I cleared the room out and I was, it was just me in there. And I just like, I just like got down on my knees and just like, prayed that like 
I could do it because I'm just what a confidence for someone like Elton John to put in a 20 year old kid. You know, yeah, you're not Dave Grohl. You're not. I'm Brandon not Dave Flowers, Grohl. You know I'm, what I mean? Yeah. What I mean by that is you don't have those years and of experience. I, I, I'm not. I'm just not the. I, I don't feel like. I don't feel famous. I don't mm-hmm. feel like a big deal or anything like mm-hmm. that. And so to be up there with folks that, you know, kind of are like, it's just like, it was, it was a really humbling moment for me. It felt very scary. And I just remember just being on my knees. Like I, I was crying that morning. I was so scared. And I, I and then I, I, I walked, I walked down and my heart's pounding and then I'm, I'm back behind the stage and there's, there's a video of me somewhere of, of me behind the stage and you can see the crowd. And it's just, I remember seeing it for the first time before I really got to look at it. I just saw flags and just thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And as far as you could look, like wow. it just kept going. Wow. And I remember you have to walk out onto the stage to go to the side stage. And so I had to walk out and I saw everything. And then I got to the side and I remember making it a point to really look at everything and really process it as quickly as I could. I was like, you're about to walk out there. There's... 250,000 people. Dude, I'm even getting nervous, like, saying it again. Like, I'm getting kind of <laughs> shaky. Like, it was, uh, and I remember just taking a deep breath, and David, uh, Elton's husband, and uh-huh. uh, he was up there with his kids, and he was just like, go get it, Sanchez. I'm like, and, and I remember just, I just, as soon as I walked out, as soon as he called my name, I just felt like, I just felt like I could split this guy in half. Like, I was just, I was fearless, which freaked me out even a little more because I walked out and I, I just didn't feel scared like at all. Like I just felt like I could do anything. And we played the song and it went tremendously well. And I had the crowd sing it back and they did, which is puts so much into perspective, the reach that that song has had as well. And, and then, you know, the song ended, I went up and hugged Delton and, uh, and then that was it. And, and then I walked back to the Green room and someone texts me. They're like, Paul McCartney was watching you, and I was oh like, Oh my I was god! Like, holy wow. shit! And I wow. was like, Holy shit! And then, uh, you know, and then I went and watched the rest of his set, and uh, you know, all these artists came up left and right to me to say how good. A fla- Slash came up and gave me a fist bump. He said, "You're amazing." Kate Hudson pinched my cheek. I was like, Oh my god, Penny Lane! <laughs> Penny Lane likes me. You know, I- I'm not Stillwater, but she loves me. You know, and. Uh, and, you know, uh, Marcus Mumford came up and, you know, uh, holy shit. And, uh, who, oh, my God, Rick Astley came up to me. They're never going to give you up. They're never going to give you up. And he was like, oh, you are amazing. And I was like, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and then, I like how he says that like he sings. And then, yeah. I swear to God, I'm, I'm, I'm sat. We just finished out and we watched out and play Rocket Man for the last time. Yeah, last show. Last show. And, I, and I'm standing there and I see Paul McCartney across the way. I'm like, and as we're leaving, you know, the show ends. Paul McCartney comes walking towards me. No way! I would lose my mind. Oh my god! I, I was, I was mind. freaking out. I was like, yeah. I was like, I was just staring at him. I was like, he's not walking towards me right now. And he, and, he, and then he was, and he was walking like this. He was like very like, very cool, very cool with it. And he just goes and he stops and he goes, you. And I was like, me. And he's like, yeah, you. And I, and he comes walking towards me even more. And we and we come together. And he's like, holy, you've got some pipes, man. And I was just like. Oh my God, thank you so much. And then he just pulls me in for this long, deep hug. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just, I'm hugging him for a while. And I'm just like, this man's not loosening his grip. Like he's like hugging me for a minute. And he's ah. like, he's like, man, it's, it's the, it's the ley lines, you know, Glastonbury. It's, uh, you know, uh, Stonehenge is the heart shocker of the earth. It's why there's so much love here. I'm like, Wow, like name a more Paul McCartney thing to say. Like, and, and then, uh, and then that was it. And he said, "Well done, man." Like, and and then I left, and I was like, I actually I went back to the green and I threw a chair because like I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. I literally picked up a chair and I chucked. That's it the at happiest all. chair throwing in rock and roll history, chair. by the way. It was the happiest chair throwing in, yeah, in rock and roll uh, history. Long-winded story, but it was a uh, uh, great it was story. Amazing. Great it was story. Amazing. Uh, and uh, all to say, it was the craziest thing I've ever done. Pull, cool. pull those headphones back up. Let's listen to some more music. Yeah. Take a listen to this. Is 
theremin? It is. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You don't hear the theremin anymore. It wasn't my doing. It was uh, it was Bobby Goldsboro's doing. The guy who sang Honey? Oh yeah, that's a so fun fact, if you didn't know, uh that song was written from a sped up or slowed down sample of Honey. By Bobby Goldsboro. By Bobby Goldsboro. The first ten seconds, just the intro. And then and then we wrote the rest of the song. Oh cool. Very cool. I'm not crazy about Honey by Bobby Goldsboro, to be honest. It's a terribly sad song. It actually. is, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, but I, I just I, remember there was this line in it that's like, I put something around her neck and then I said, what the heck? Or something like that. Like, I don't know. Oh, I, I said, what the heck? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm, just, yeah. No, no disrespect to the estate of Bobby Goldsboro. Yeah, it's just like, all right, man, there, there could have been a better lyric there. <laughs> I mean, you really, you really could have been, yeah. Um, uh, in the limited time we, we have left, I, I just want to talk a little bit about this record. Um, so can you very briefly, because I don't want to give too much away, explain the sure. concept behind the album? And also, after everything you, you told me, well, actually, maybe I'll ask that in a second. Can you just give us the brief Cole's notes of the concept record? Of- Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it is the life, the love, and the death of famed crooner, the troubadour Sanchez, whose career was launched back in 1958 after playing Until I Found You on the Connie Co Show and then releasing a tremendous amount of hits over the years until he landed himself a residency at a club called The Angel, uh, which was owned by a mob boss named Hunter in 1964, where he meets Hunter's girlfriend Evangeline, and the troubadour and Evangeline spark up a secret romance, trying to escape their separate realities and uh, end up landing into some hot water because of it. If you you look at these artists that you were just talking to me about... At some point in their careers, they they did release sort of concepty records. Mm-hmm. McCartney, uh, of course, with the Beatles, puts mm-hmm. out um, uh, Sgt. and Peppers. You know, oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Elton John, as the years go by, releases more more concept records. I mean, you know, there there are Killers records which are seen to be more concept records. Totally, you know what I mean. Uh, but they were or later in their careers after they'd sort of established themselves. Sure. What I find interesting about you is you get all this attention on you from that that song we were just talking mm-hmm. about, and it, the the time has come for uh, and I admire this in you. Um, the time has come for the big. Uh, hey, this is my own record. Nice job with the cough button. Uh, nice a little cough. Well, most people just cough, and I had to edit it out afterwards. <laughs> I don't have to edit it out. They edit it out. Look at this face I'm getting right now for me. Like a, I don't have to do anything around here. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa has to edit it out afterwards. There it is. Um, but I. Uh, yeah, sorry, Vanessa. Sorry for pretending that I do any work. Uh, the, the, the the point being is that it's it's later in their careers that they they do that. You for the big A. Everyone's looking at me. Yeah. Time for the debut record. Albums obviously mean a lot to you. Yeah. You go concept record right off the wazoo. Oh, yeah. Why? I, I think when it came down to like making this record, it was just until I found you happened. And then Evangeline happened. And it was just, it kind of set the stage like, oh, man, I would love to release a record that was all of these sounds that I love from that time. And as we started writing the record, it just kind of presented itself naturally as a story. You know, Evangeline became a character and then we played around with the idea just playfully, like, what if I was a 1950s crooner? Like, what would my band name be? Like, James Brown and his famous flames, Elvis Presley and the Blue Moon Boys, like, what would Stephen Sanchez be? And it was now Stephen Sanchez and the Moon Crests. So the boys in the band are the Moon Crests. I, I love that there's, there's some tenacity there to be like, hey, everyone, all eyes are on me. I'm going to, I'm going to, not, this is not going to be personally revealing. I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah. I, I just think it's just more interesting. Like think about all the music that's out right now. It's very much, it's very personal. I, every bit of music right now mm-hmm. is very, very personal. It's either about a very personal breakup or, or a s- circumstance in one's life. Something like, you're going through. Something you're going through. Yeah. And, and this is just about characters so everybody can be a part of it. You know, I, I feel like I've lost people in the sense where I've just written about, I've written songs that have been about my life, you know, and I I think I expect people to understand, you know, what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people just, you can't expect them to. You mm-hmm. can't expect them to understand your perspective mm-hmm. on things, like your feelings on things. But mm-hmm. to write a record that can be universally received because it's about fake characters and people can make up whatever they want because there's not this like like they can attach any song to whatever whatever feeling they want because there's not the, the restriction you know on it that like this is about this this one this is not this is about this one thing this that is about this one thing that happened yeah, yeah exactly yeah. we're yeah. like you know i mean it can just 
it can just exist in whatever space people need it to. And I, I just love storytelling I've found. It's just so exciting for me. And I, I feel like doing that in a debut record just feels exciting because it just makes it more special. It makes it feel more impactful that even just personally, like it's just like, this wasn't just about my feelings. Like, and now it's five years later and I don't feel those things that way anymore. And it's like, I, I'm very much a person where like if I've processed something and I've gotten over it, like I, I don't really have much of an emotional attachment to the thing that happened mm -hmm. as much. Or is this because it is very much something outside of myself. Like it feels like I can be as excited about it as like a fan might because I'm like all oh, these characters. And like, yeah, you have to make a movie. Dead. Yeah, it's like a exactly. It's just, it's so fun and it's just like yeah, I just it's enjoyable. <laughs> um, you're man, you're a, a singularly uh, uh, progressive uh, man. And, uh, uh, and and interesting and uh, in, in the way you think about this music. Um, I really do. do appreciate you coming in. Um, Thanks for chatting. Well, I wish we had more time to, to kick it. You know what? Next, really next nice. time you come in, we'll, we'll get them to book you three hours. That'd be beautiful. That'd we'll, be wonderful. We'll put cucumbers over our eyes. <laughs> yeah. And we'll put on some spa music. Amazing. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and yeah. we'll, you know, we'll, just, we'll get buried in the sand up to our necks, like on it's these nice. doing beaches in the 60s. It's, very, it's a very beautiful thing. Uh,